Hey guys, Ralph here. Welcome to True Power Trumpet Fitness on this fabulous Friday here in Connecticut. Love Fridays, man. Uh, yeah, let's get right to it. Um, I had my uh, dentist nonsense tomorrow, couldn't get anything up, and this is going to be an ongoing thing. I'll keep you posted. It's The gory details are not all that interesting, but um, I will be taking days off in the coming months to get that... Uh, straightened out. I'll explain a different time. You don't, you don't want to hear about it. Anyway, you saw the, um, you saw the thumbnail. Charlie Schluter. One of the great ones, man. One of the great ones. Absolutely 100%. One of the great ones. A Vacchiano prodigy. Anyway, uh, let me honk a little bit and we will um, take it from there. Talk about Charlie Schluter. in double C's, three active G-chromatic scales. Anyway, Charlie Schluter. Um, this is sort of in between. I know quite a bit about him, but not really a lot. I'll explain, okay? But um, terrific, terrific player. And one came from the great Vacchiano camp, Broyles. Tom Stevens, you know, I just Juilliard the whole nine yards. Um, born in Illinois, Illinois, um, had the chops at an early age. Had the chops at an early age. I heard um, Vacchiano talked about him quite a bit. Jerry loved him, knew of his playing, witnessed his playing, and he said during Juilliard, uh, Latin bands as well as Brandenburg's. No problem. No problem. Guys, that's chops. That's chops. He could have done theater. He could have done lead. He could have done anything he wanted. I mean, he was just a terrific, terrific trumpet player. And like Mel Broyles, like Phil Smith, his trumpet and his chops and everything were pretty much ready to go by the time he even got to Juilliard. Okay? Four years later, Vacchiano polishes the gem, and he was out playing. Uh, his whole claim to fame was orchestral, even though he could have done commercial and did do commercial while he was at Juilliard. Um, he went right to, I believe it was the Kansas City Philharmonic, to the uh, Minneapolis and whatnot, and then finally for 25 years with the uh, Boston Symphony. And all along the ways, he just killed it. He just killed it. I heard him once in uh, Lincoln Center with the Boston Symphony, and um, he didn't play much. He didn't play much. There's a couple little ditties and, you know, some of the... But that's the thing that I think, if anything, held him back. In that Ozawa's concept of sound and the way he chose music, Ravel, and all that sort of stuff, didn't really lend itself for Charlie showing his, his chops a lot of times. And he had them. He had them absolutely. You put Charlie in Herseth's seat, I think he could have done pretty much the same. He, his chops were that good. Okay. Um, now, I heard him once at Lincoln Center, not much to it, and believe it or not, at Vacchiano's funeral. Sweets, can I call you back in five minutes? Yeah, sure. Love you. Okay, love you too. Bye-bye. Bye. She's the only one I pick up for, her and my wife. 
Gorgeous blondes run my life. Anyway, um, at Vakiana's funeral, and at Vakiana's funeral up in the choir loft was everybody who was anybody. Anybody who was everybody. Everybody, I mean, a who's who of the trumpet world at that time that studied with Vakiano. Uh, they notified me, they asked me if I wanted to participate, and I knew I was going to be too emotional to do it. I just sat down there and pretty much cried the whole time. Anyway, um, I tell you what, it was basically a trumpet choir, okay? Did a lot of Gabrielli and all that, different uh, antiphonal choirs and all that sort of stuff, and, but some played solos. Uh, and what I'm about to say, guys, don't take anything from it. It means nothing. It was like 10 o'clock in the morning on, a, on like a Saturday morning. All of them were playing Friday night, you know, warm up and all this sort of stuff. But Phil Smith sounded terrible. <laughs> I mean, air, ghost notes, the whole, he sounded terrible. Schluter sounded fabulous. <laughs> you know, what, what does that mean? I, I, you know what I think of Phil Smith, Okay. But um, he played some sort of a lyrical thing. I think it might have been a Mahler thing. I'm not sure. I believe I did not have don't have perfect pitch now, nor at the time. I got the impression the top note was an A. And the lyrical tone, the fullness of tone that he got was just absolutely beautiful. And that was on the Monat trumpets. And this is what I want to talk about. Now, if you also look at uh, pictures of him, because of the full beard that he had pretty much his whole adult life, it's almost impossible to get a look at his chops. I can't find anything. If anybody comes up with something while he's playing, <coughs> I'd love to see it. Because, you know, thick bottom lip, you know, tight corners, you know, mangled lips, you can't see. You can't see. So, um, there is that. Now, I do know, and this is gossip, and I don't like to partake in gossip, but it is pretty well known that he had run-ins with Ozawa. And I understand it was mostly, or all, concerned with volume and tone. As I tell you, Ozawa was not the, as great as he is, and I'm not knocking him, his concept of tone did not really take uh, shine with uh, Charlie Schluter's strong points. Okay, he was a tremendously strong player. Um, and he did have, did have run-ins with Ozawa. Uh, to the point there was talk of buying out his, his contract and all this sort of stuff. Guys, I don't know. I don't know. That's what you hear, and it's all scuttlebutt. But um, that was pretty, pretty much the, um, that was pretty much the gossip at the time. So even a player of that magnitude, guys, for no reason of his own, can go through crap in the music business. Anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave a link down below of the, uh, the entire uh, Bartok Concerto for Orchestra. I love that piece, beginning to end. It's about 34, 35 minutes, so you may not want the whole thing. But the big final salvo is from, um, uh, 30 minutes to about 34 minutes would be the whole thing. And you hear his tone and power. Now, um, he played the last how many years of his career on Monet trumpets and mouthpieces. And you know what I feel about them. I don't like the tone. I don't like the tone at all. Um, subjective thing. If you do, that's fine. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Bach mouthpieces, I say, you know what I feel about them. This, if you like it, great. It, it's a certain thing. It's not for me. It didn't sound like Mel Broyles. It didn't sound like Marciano. It's, it's more of a fluffy, lyrical tone. Anyway, um, I'm not sure if that was a result. I, I'm under the impression, and maybe I'm wrong, that he was financially invested in Monet. Okay? Herseth, I know for a fact, was financially invested in Monet, and you can't find anywhere that he's playing a Monet trumpet. Okay, I'm not sure if um, Schluter is or not. Leave down below if it is. I'm not sure if the switch to Monet was because of the financial investment or is that sort of a direct result of the issues he was having with Ozawa. A little bit of both, who knows. As again, a lot of what I'm saying is conjecture. Okay, as you know, and I don't like to do that, but I am 100% 
on board with his playing. Do I like Mel Broyles, Herseth, Phil Smith better than that Maonet sound? sound? You bet. And as I said, I'm not sure if it's the player or the trumpet that I am having my issues with. But even with the Monet, well, you hear the concerto for orchestra down below is on the Monet trumpet. And there's no shortage for tone and power. So anyway, that's that. And again, if you guys have any other morsels uh, that you can add to the discussion, please do it down so we can all partake of it. If you don't feel like you want to put it on a comment board, email me and I will do it and keep your name out of it. All right. All right. Guys, uh, we'll talk again on Monday and eat and drink your fruits and vegetables and live your life with true power. Love you all.